The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, uh, so this morning I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Peter Weber. Uh, Dr. Weber is professor here at the Icon School of Medicine and heads the, uh, the, uh, the is chief of the otology, neuro-otology um, for the Mount Sinai system. He's also director of the Ear Institute down at uh, New York Eye and Ear. Um, we're very pleased that Dr. Weber has come on board. He has has a very uh, varied and uh, extensive history with experience from University of Massachusetts and Cleveland Clinic. He has served as the chief medical officer of Cochlear Corporation. Um, he's developing several new exciting programs as it relates to cochlear implantation and is expanding our posterior skull-based skull program. Um, we are very excited to have him here, and uh, today he'll be talking about what I have learned as an otologist. So, uh, Dr. Weber. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. I hate standing in front of a podium, so I may walk around a little bit. Um, full disclosure for everything, uh, I still am a consultant and uh, it goes on all my talks. Uh, Alice, uh, you know, bring us back to what we are. Uh, we are all physicians. We are all doctors, all right? And, you know, I have little bits of uh, definitions from various uh, dictionaries about uh, what it means to be a, a physician and other things as we go out the uh, day. The ear. It's really a cool thing. It's probably the best thing in otolaryngology. I mean, I can't think of anything better. It's all packed into this little two-centimeter cubic region, but there's a lot there. Your vestibular system is there, your ability to be able to hear is there, your ability to be able to taste, move your face, smile, stick out your pocket, everything is there. And so that's really what got me excited. It's the whole reason I went to medical school. All right? uh, the reason I went, I was doing research on the fluid dynamics within the inner ear. That's when cochlear implants first started coming into the boat. And I decided, nah, rather than do that, be an engineer, I'm going to go to medical school. Now, one of the things about what I've learned, and this talk is really generated more for probably residents, but I think everybody will pick up a kernel here or there. And that is, you got to sort of know what makes you happy, what makes you pick, and where your passions are within this field. Uh, I started off doing a lot of sort of basic science. And, you know, I had to get hit over the head a bunch of times to realize that, you know, sitting in a lab under a microscope, counting cells, um, really wasn't something that really interested me that much. But I still was able to do some of the work, uh, published on it, but I moved down to clinical research. But I learned that, for me, clinical research is much more exciting. Translational research is much more exciting. And as you move throughout your careers, you've got to make that same sort of judgment for yourself. I learned that teamwork is essential, all right? And I think we all learn this, but I have to interact with a lot of people, neurosurgery, neurology, head and neck surgeons. Not always the easiest people to interact with, right? I mean, the ear guys were all nice and happy and, you know, jovial, you know? But... Teamwork is essential, and this, this slide sort of depicts that. Uh, this is when I was a fellow in Iowa for the 100-year flood. Everybody in the city was out there helping. That's the main water supply for the city. We almost lost it. But again, it's all about teamwork and being able to work together as a team for the benefit of our patients. And that brings us to the next slide. What else have I learned? We are a service industry. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are a service industry. We are here to take care of our patients. We are able to give them the best care, but we're here to service them, and we can't forget that. But it's not just the patients. We service everybody that sends us patients. And we've got to make sure that we acknowledge that and cultivate those relationships so that we really do provide the best service for our referring physicians, for our patients, and their families. And this is just because I think Four Seasons does a great job of providing service. Now, the biggest thing I've learned is things change. All right, I've been in this 25 years, 
And I can't tell you the number of things that I have seen that have changed over the years. First thing I'm going to concentrate on is sort of my passion, and that's cochlear implants, uh, Baja implants, and what is new and what has changed. It used to be I would stand out the door when I first started and I would do this, and nobody would hear you at all. I mean, it, they were completely stone deaf. That was the indication for a cochlear implant. And as we'll see in a few slides, that's not the case anymore. And I don't know how many people actually realize that. But hearing loss is a huge problem in the United States. It's actually one of the only diagnoses that is classified as an epidemic by the World Health Organization. Because so many people have it. Now, the potential number of candidates for a cochlear implant is pretty high. We don't even come close to implanting to incidents. We're at about 100,000 a year worldwide. It's only 5% penetration of people who actually could benefit from this technology actually ever receive it. That's for adults. For kids, it's abysmal. We're at 50%. Every kid now gets diagnosed with newborn infant hearing screening, and yet we still only capture 50% of those children that could benefit from a cochlear implant actually ever make it to getting it. So we have a lot of work to do. Now, what's also important is the change over the years of how well people do. When we first started, if a person was able to repeat a word back, one word, we were ecstatic. That was the greatest thing in the world. Now, I'm unhappy if they can't talk on the telephone, if they can't hear their significant other in the other room. We've come a long way in our expectations of what a cochlear implant really should be able to provide to patients. And we've made a big push recently in our elderly. Untreated hearing losses we're starting to determine has a correlation with early cognitive disorders, such as dementia. We're looking, and it also shows now that probably there is a cause and effect as well. Early depression, early dementia, you can't hear. And so by reversing that, there are some studies now that are out there that are actually demonstrating that we can have a positive effect on patients if we catch them early enough with some of these cognitive delays. Now, the surgery is also changed for cochlear implants. We as surgeons now make a huge difference. When I started this, that wasn't the case. We basically, we took our drill, we drilled on top of the promontory, it's like drilling for oil, it's done in two seconds, and we shoved an electrode into the cochlea. And I make it sound sort of barbaric because nowadays we're very delicate surgeons. We make sure that we enter only the scale of tympany. We don't disrupt any of the inner ear pathology or cells within the inner ear. And we place the electrode in very slowly and we keep it in scale of tympany because if we don't, we now know that those patients are not going to do as well. If we disrupt the basilar membrane, if we get into the scale of the stibuli, the patient just won't do as well. They'll still be able to hear, but they won't do as well as they could have if we did our job correctly. And all this was brought about by sort of a, a new system and now new indications. So for 30 years, the indications for a cochlear implant really hadn't budged or changed much. And what we've now done is increased who can be a candidate? So when I started, you had to be 90 dB or worse. Then it moved up a little bit. You could have a little bit of low frequency and come down. Sentences, you could get up to 50% right. Now, look at this. You can have absolutely normal hearing in the low frequencies. You drop off on this ski slope down to about 70 decibels. And your CNC words, which is now different than sentences, can be about 60%. And 
And the whole reason that we can do this is that these patients, the ones who have hearing like this, are ones who do not get benefit from their hearing aids. It's not for every patient who has this type of an audiogram. But for those patients who a hearing aid does not work for them, this is an alternative. Now, they have to understand that we might still lose some hearing here when we do the surgery. But if we do our job correctly, we have a very good chance of preserving that hearing so that now they could wear a hearing aid plus the cochlear implant on that side. And so if we look at uh, some that have done recently, um, what we're really trying to do is get this hearing here back up to here in that normal range. <coughs> now, it works, as I said, well, but we have to tell patients, in my hands, it's about 25% that I will still have hearing loss on patients that's significant. It doesn't happen at the time of surgery, though. It usually happens three to six months after activation. Whether it's due to a foreign body reaction, whether it is due to um, uh, some type of autoimmune response, we're not sure. But that's the part we have to work on. Asymmetric hearing loss. In the past, it was a cross hearing aid. Maybe a bi cross if they had hearing loss on the other side. It wasn't very good. It involved a lot of wires, a lot of cables. The sound quality was poor. And nowadays, it's wireless. It's actually not bad. Probably about a third of my patients choose this type of an intervention. But we've moved into another realm as well. And that is providing a cochlear implant as an option for these patients. Now, the, the caveat here is that adults take longer to adapt if they have normal hearing in the opposite ear. And that has to be explained to them very, very well. Because instead of taking three months or six months, it may take them nine to 12 months to really adapt to that new sound. Children, you know, they're, they're sponges. They're so plastic. Um, they don't know the difference, and they accommodate to this really fast and really well, as long as you get them early. Um, and the benefit, really, is this increased ability to understand speech and language in noise, as well as localization from a safety issue. The other option is the Baja, and we'll talk a little bit now about how this has changed. My practice has certainly changed. Uh, the Europeans, 70 to 75 percent of the people in every other part of the world except the U.S., the indication for a Baja is actually a mixed or a conductive hearing loss, not single-sided deafness. In the U.S., it's flipped. 75% is for single-sided deafness and only 25% for mixed and conductive. Part of that, I think, is due to the fact that we have to be able to figure out when to say enough is enough. How many times are we willing to do it fork and a fork and have it fail? Is it one time? Is it two times? Is it three times? I get patients sometimes that have six, seven, eight surgeries trying to fiddle with that torpor fork to make their hearing better. At some point in time, you got to admit to yourself it just isn't going to work. And so I've taken those patients that have had multiple, multiple operations, the ones with adelopathic drums, where you know it's not going to work, and we've offered them this. The procedure itself has changed. Anybody here remember the old way of doing a Baja? Yeah, right? I mean, you, you did a little skin flap, you took out all this soft tissue, it was a bloody mess, it hurt, it looked like, you know, on the side of the head somebody took their sandwich and took a divot out of the side of somebody's head. It was horrible. And so, about 10, 12 years ago, um, I came up with a different way of doing the operation. And by the way, I hate to shave hair. I never shave hair on anybody. Um, and we made a small incision. And we've been following these patients now for a long time. You can see that you can still see the, um, 
where you have to drill pretty easily, two stitches in afterwards, and it heals up really nice. And the first time we presented this, um, unfortunately, the uh, person who invented the operation over in Sweden was there and uh, really didn't like this approach. Uh, neither did some of the other people, but it's caught on now. And uh, it's really the standard of what people do for Baja surgery now. It's just a simple 15 minute operation. And this is a little bit older processor, they have a newer one now. But it's much more cosmetically appealing. And the technology has allowed people to hear much better. The other thing by doing surgery this way is we decrease the number of skin reactions and soft tissue reactions. So it used to be 25 to 35% of all patients got some type of skin infection. And now we're down to probably somewhere between 5 to 7%. Also, the attract has come out. That one now does not have a post that comes out through the skin. Now, it's a little bit bigger, I think, and cosmetically it looks a little bit bigger, but patients have a right to choose. They can either have the post that comes through the skin or the magnet that's under the skin, but they choose what's right for them. The only time I choose for them is if they're going to need multiple MRI scans afterwards, because then you don't want the magnet, obviously. So, what I've learned is that we can now implant this stuff behind the ear for people to be able to hear, and they're really not going to notice it all that much anymore, and we've provided a great service for them. And things always are continuing to change. And when you're going to change something, always make sure you got a reason for it. All right, whether you did the study, whether it's a question you wanted to answer, but you know, try to avoid things, well, that's the way I always do it, and yeah, my friend told me to do it. In your mind, have a real reason for changing what you do. All right, it's <clears throat> gonna benefit a patient. When I first started out, I would salivate like Pavlov's dog over something like this. I mean, it's a beautiful glomus tumor to take out surgically, it's gonna be challenging, but the morbidity that we inflicted on our patients with that type of surgery is not insignificant. And when I was in uh, Cleveland, we started looking at this, and over a long period of time, we started doing stereotactic radiation for these tumors. The morbidity is considerably less. There's almost no growth uh, from this. Out of 30 patients, there was one patient that grew. Patients are happier, and really, we've changed the way we manage glomus turbularis now for our patients. Um, and I think it's the way to go, and that's just you know my sort of feeling. And it's pretty much that way throughout the country. You also have to learn when not to operate. Small acoustic neuromas. When I started out, the teaching was you got to take it out before you lose their hearing. It's the best chance that you have of, of uh, being able to preserve hearing. But now we know that 30 to 50 percent of these actually don't grow. More in older people than younger people. But if there's no vestibular complaints, no hearing loss, and you've got a four or five millimeter tumor, we're going to watch that nowadays in most cases. The other option that's come out for patients since I started doing this is stereotactic radiation therapy for these as well. And a lot of people now choose stereotactic radiation therapy for this. I also learned that I don't leave a vestibular nerve if I'm going to operate and I find that a tumor is only on the superior or inferior vestibular nerve because they do not compensate well if you leave one nerve. All right, when not to operate. All right, I just had a patient the other day. Um, Sam was the one who showed me this patient in clinic. Teed up for an operation. What are you going to do for this guy? He's got a dry, anatomic ear. 
you can operate on this all you want, but you're not going to cure his underlying disease and he's going to continue to have problems. If it's a safe, dry ear, you can treat the hearing loss some other way. But it's one of those things where, from my standpoint, it took me a while, I think, to figure it out and learn the hard way, that not every ear that you see that has some sort of pathology actually has to absolutely positively have an operation. All right, so some retraction pockets, if we're able to take care of them and they're clean, we'll leave them be. This is always a funny story to me. Uh, I trained at Pittsburgh. Um, if anybody's ever been there, trained there, heard Charlie Bluestone talk, um, we used to admit people for a draining ear with tubes, daily suctioning, IV antibiotics, the whole bit. And I got to Iowa. And I saw this, and I was like, oh, I got to bring a patient in. Bruce looked at me and goes, take the dang tube out. What's wrong with you? And so things evolve and things change. And I learned here that there are other ways. So just because you learn something at one institution doesn't always mean that that's the right protocol for treating a patient. And so I put that out there so that it, you remember it's a lifelong commitment to learning. And you can change your practice. So yeah, we can take the tube out. Uh, I did a study once on pure oxygen for some people that helps. But <clears throat> always remember that you've got to question what you're doing. And you've got to remember that you have a toolbox full of tools that you've developed over the years. Not everything is a nail because you have a hammer. All right? You have a whole bunch of tools that you can use in your arsenal to treat patients. So, like I said, I can operate for an acoustic neuroma, but I can also radiate the patient for an acoustic neuroma. I do both. It doesn't matter to me what a patient chooses. All right? I'm still going to give them the best care. You have to remember that when you're doing this, it's not a video game. This is a real patient. But it does work. Gargoyles. All right? Um, this I started off with. You know, sort of, I like gargoyles. They're interesting to photograph. Um, this is just one of those that I put in as a filler. To let me know that I went through a stage where we questioned what we did. I had patients who were complaining to me, why do you got to shave half my head? I don't, I don't want anyone to know I had an operation. And it's something we always did, right? We always shaved. But then I thought, okay, well, maybe we don't have to. So I looked at four different sets of patients, our neurotologic patients and our otologic patients. For the neurotologic patients, we looked at some patients that we did shave, some patients that we didn't shave, and we actually found that the patients that we didn't shave, although it's not significantly different, they trended a little bit less likely to have inflammation or an infection. And because of that, I don't shave anymore for any type of operation I do. Now, I can't convince every neurosurgeon that that's the way to go. Um, but mainly that's probably because I have to work a little bit harder to close. All right? I want to keep the hair out of the incision. And so it means, for me, I have to work a little bit harder. But the patient is a lot happier. And it goes back to service. Headaches. We had a lot of headaches after suboccipital approaches. We think it's due to a dural attachment to the fibrosis and scar tissue that forms. We also think it might have to do with the large craniotomies that we create as well. And so back at uh, Charleston when I started and we carried it over to Cleveland as well, we started making small keyhole craniotomies, and we either did a bone pate plug um, to seal that area off, or we actually took a little bone plug and put it back. 
But here you can see this is the size of our craniotomy in order to remove any type of lesion in a suboccipital approach. It's about the size of a nickel. You can see from the little tines on the self-retaining retractor, it's not that big. And we would take out three, four centimeter acoustics through this uh, or bigger. And what we also found is that the number of our headaches by doing this went down significantly. When we looked at 81 patients, there were only two that had severe headaches, which is a much lower percentage than anybody else was getting with this type of surgery. Don't forget that it feels good to do humanitarian work. And you don't have to go to Nicaragua, you don't have to go down to South America or over to Africa. You can do it here in our own backyard in New York City. You will really feel good helping others. Um, this is just one trip that I took down to Guyana. I didn't drink the Kool-Aid, I promise. Um, but I always took a resident with me wherever we went. And I always did ears. All right, here's a little microscope that we would bring with us in order to do ear surgery. Uh, they changed their tubes, uh, they reused their ET tubes. But one day we were in there and we saw this kid came in. This was a six-year-old kid who was out hunting and he sucked in the dart that he wanted to kill the animal with instead of blowing it out. And it had been there for a long time and he couldn't breathe. Um, very fortunate we were able to get this out uh, in this type of a setting. But you really feel like you're helping people who can't help themselves. And so if you ever have the opportunity to volunteer, take it. You'll feel really good about yourself. And I still do it today. And those are, those are things that I've learned. Things still change. All right. This one I give all the time to residents. New products come out all the time on the market. All right. And they're always the greatest thing in the world. All right. Anybody ever use Otosham? All right, that's the laser to make a urogotomy. Do it in the office. Gosh, it's going to be so great. All right, they brought that in. I've never seen a kid scream more in their life. He actually got up off of the chair and table and walked out the door and wouldn't come back into my office. All right, and I, I thought, oh my gosh. And the thing didn't work, but they, they tried. The company tried. The Miniette device, that don't work either. Anybody remember layup surgery? All right, snoring. Um, he used to tell us, and we'll see in a couple slides, hydroxyapatite, he used to tell us it doesn't need cartilage because it'll never extrude. Oh my gosh, what a, what a you know, problem that was. Um, balloon sinuplasty, all right, I put that up here because that may actually work for some patients. But right now, you see the ads, I mean, it's embarrassing, right, you know? Increase your practice revenue by five hundred thousand dollars. Use the balloon. It's not why we're in medicine, all right. So you know, if you're going to use something, use it for the right thing. How about the ear popper? This one's the, this one's really good. So this one you put on the nose, and then you know you have the patient swallow, and it pushes air up to pop the ear open if it's a little retracted because of mutation tube dysfunction, or there's fluid in there. And if you read their study, it works 65% of the time to get rid of fluid. And I asked them, I said, well, but if you read the literature, 85% of the time it goes away on its own. What, why would I buy this? And they sort of looked at me and said, uh, next, um, question. Look at the studies that manufacturers do. All right, really, really decide if it's something that is going to benefit your patients. And you're going to see stuff like this all the time. But as a practitioner, you've got to evaluate these things. Don't take it on face value that something works just because some company tells you it does. Look at the data. Look how they studied it. There's some new ones coming out. All right, there's gels that we're going to inject into the ear with steroids or an antibiotic, I can tell you that the results are no different than if I take an off-the-shelf steroid 
which cost me two bucks, versus something that's going to cost me five hundred or a thousand bucks in jet. But you're going to hear about all that in the near future. What's the newest thing that's coming out in otology? Endoscopic ear surgery. All right. It has a place, I think. All right. Now I can be an old curmudgeon. All right, and think, oh gosh, really? I mean. And I've been to a couple of courses where I am the invited old curmudgeon who is bursting the you know young guy who is you know playing a video game holding the endoscope. The endoscope is pretty cool, and I use it to look around. And sometimes I miss cholesteatoma and the sinus tympani or something, and it'll help you get it out of nooks and crevices. But for the life of me, I still can't understand why I would hold an endoscope in one hand, have only one hand to operate. Look at a screen which is 2D and not 3D and do a stapedectomy. Where otherwise I can have 3D visualization under a microscope and two hands to operate. But it is something that's coming um, and we'll see. I think it has its place. I just don't know how, how much it does. Tinnitus, thank God we have meds and other things now that can help it. Um, because otherwise these patients were very hard uh, to treat in the office. But we have some good things we can offer them now. Um, this is the bane of a neurotologist's existence, right? These dizzy patients. But what did God provide us? Vestibular rehab. And my goodness, it makes a difference. All right? Wherever you go, if you are seeing dizzy patients, Make sure that you hook up with a good vestibular rehab therapist that can really help your patient. Because otherwise, they're going to continue to suffer. They'll be in your office, and you're not going to get better. Be careful what you study and publish. When I was a resident, I uh, got talked into doing some research on PLFs or perilymphatic fistulas. It's a topic that is somewhat controversial. And what we were able to show after a while using uh, beta 2 transfer is that they exist, but probably not to the degree that a lot of people were touting that they existed. And they only existed with inner ear malformations like an enlarged vestibular aqueduct or a middle ear abnormality like an abnormal stages or an incus, which you could see on the CT scan. But when you write something like that, all of a sudden everybody thinks that you are a true believer as well. And patients and referrals come out of the woodwork to see you for this type of a diagnosis. Doc, this is what I have. You've got to operate on me. And I got to tell you, I, I really wasn't that much of a believer. Uh, you know, it's like not believing in gargoyles, right? I mean, they're there and they're nice to photograph, but not a true believer. And it took about six or seven years for that type of referral to stop. So always remember in the back of your mind what you're actually writing about. Now, presence, do you, you, you get this from uh, us as attendings a lot? Think. All right, just don't react. Think about something. All right. So for the ear, you know, I thought long and hard about lots of different things. One was sputal reconstruction. I've seen it two ways. You've got an adicholesteatoma. How are you going to repair this? Should you put cartilage in for the sputum? Should you not? Should you just fix it? What should you do? You want your ear, hopefully, to look like something like this. It's a little bit hard to see, but you see the cartilage graft. This is what I do now. Every patient looks like this. Uh, well, what can I say? Right? Like Donald Trump. Yeah, everything is beautiful. Um, and there are advantages to using the cartilage. All right? It prevents the retraction pocket from recurring there. It may not prevent it from recurring somewhere else, though. And it reconstructs that defect. And it has no adverse effects on hearing that we'll see. The problem is you can't see through it. It's stiff. It takes a little bit more time. But I wanted to see whether or not I really should be using cartilage up there and how it affected the hearing. So we looked at a bunch of patients who had no cartilage. All right. 
And about 42% of them develop a post-operative retraction pocket up into the posterior superior quadrant yet again that was going to require surgery. Now, when we did use cartilage, the retraction pocket dropped down to 25%. The caveat, though, was since those retraction pockets were typically inferior or more towards the eustachian tube, and they were easily managed in the office and didn't require further surgery in most patients. And the hearing results showed no difference between the two. And so for that reason, I reconstruct the sketal area with cartilage all the time. And you may say, well, that's, everybody knows that. But 25, 30 years ago when I did this, not everybody knew this. All right? And so this is an old, I use titanium now, but I'd like to put cartilage on any type of prosthesis I use because otherwise they will extrude. It doesn't matter what kind you use, you got to cover it with something besides fascia. And I've also learned that a canal wall down is not a bad <laughs> operation. All right, the goal is to get rid of the cholesteatoma, get a safe, dry ear, the advantages of canal wall down is that less chance of recurrence. You don't have to do a second one. It's safe. The hearing's going to be okay, but we know what happens here. You can't swim. Got to clean it a lot. If you don't do the surgery quite right, it may drain. You might leave a high facial ridge. And so, you know, you got to work on what's best for the patient. Most of the patients I saw, they didn't like cosmetically that canal wall down procedure because you could drive a truck through it. You could see it from 10 feet away that, oh yeah, she had ear surgery. I mean, it doesn't look very nice, right? Um, and so how do you get around that? Well, what I did was we went, instead of taking cartilage out and creating this large hole, I went to a technique called an incisural neoplasty. And it's something that the Don Camera taught me um, and used to lecture on. But basically, all you're doing is extending, not a true limpered incision, but you're coming out through the incisura between the cartilage plane. And you're taking it up to right about here. And when you open that up, you can actually get your whole finger through the AAC without taking out any cartilage whatsoever. And then you put a stitch in the back. And you Pull your ear posteriorly, and it will allow for a very good opening that is cosmetically appealing. Now, the problem with it is, is that I got to work harder in the office to clean the thing, all right? But for my patient, they're a lot happier. Learn that the trust is good. <clears throat> Not the trust is better, all right? Uh, I'm a pretty trusting guy, but I always want to make sure that, you know, I don't believe the radiologist when he writes, you know, what they write. I've had too many ones that come in that I do a pre-op cochlear implant, and the report comes back, implant looks to be a good position. I haven't done the operation yet, all right? So always look at your films. You never know. Um, finally... <laughs> Good. All right. Finally, we looked at a couple things, and this was an interesting study we did. I got called to be an expert witness for somebody that had hearing loss in a patient after putting in a set of tubes. All right. Anybody ever have hearing loss after putting in a set of tubes? I would venture probably not, right, unless it was pre-existing. But there was no data. We scoured the data before I went to testify, and there was nothing out there. And so quickly we went and we looked post, uh, we looked retrospectively at our cases. We looked at about 1,225. We randomly selected 550. And what we found was that there were no post-operative incidents of sensory neuroconductive loss that was not present preoperative. And we were able to use that data because we were able to get it in and get it accepted and be able to blunt and save somebody who did not cause hearing loss but didn't have a preoperative hearing test 
to show it. And so, although you probably aren't going to lose hearing when you do it, and you may not need a um, preoperative audiogram, um, the post-op is the one that's most important. Most of us still get a pre-op audiogram, but we know that we're not going to lose hearing because of tubes. And then lastly, congenital atresia. I did a lot of these. The stenosis rate is 30%. And I didn't like that. And so what we ended up doing, what we figured out to do, is we take a mold right after surgery of the ear canal that we created. And we created an acrylic stent. And it's got a hole in it. And you can take it in and out, clean it, put it back in. Parents did that. We dropped our restenosis rate from 30% down to 5%. And so... As we're looking for things to do, ways to improve care for our patients, think. Think what you can do to do it better. And I know that all of you out here have it in you. And make sure that you study it appropriately so that we can make changes that are going to benefit our patients. And finally, when I did get my MBA as well, um, and that has been extremely useful for me. Uh, I've been in charge of contract negotiations uh, for the entire physician groups with insurance companies. Uh, I can tell you that's a really interesting experience. It's been good in making regular plans, business plans, in order for me to have programs that I can show and demonstrate are going to be viable <clears throat> to the institutions that I've been at. Um, and I've also done a lot of work with the academy and the peak and the rock uh, that has also been very useful. Um, never forget, most important thing is your family. All right, so everything we do here, taking care of our patients and everything else is really important. But don't forget that you got to have some family time too. And what is in the future? I don't know. All right, you don't know what's going to be there. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. But I know things are going to change, and I know things are going to change for the better for our patients. So I keep that in mind always. So lastly, which one are you? Think about it. Most of us, I hope, are type A. So thank you, and I answer any questions that you might have. So it was a lot, but, uh, and I have 200 more slides I could go through. All right. Thank you all, and I look forward to it. Yeah. Sure.